Hello and welcome to the Arise interview, 60 glorious minutes of multifaceted discussion where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I'm Charles Anier Gould. We're coming up in the next hour as a black senior member of the House of Lords in the UK Parliament, Lord John David Beckett Taylor of Warwick represents the diversity of the British government at the highest level. When Queen Elizabeth II made him a lord in 1996, he became the only black baron in the world and the first black conservative lord in the UK since the 14th century when Parliament began. We'll speak to Lord John Taylor about what it's like to be a black baron. We'll also talk to him about Donald Trump's state visit to the UK and the president's striking intervention in British politics, as well as the race to become the next leader of the Conservative Party and therefore the British Prime Minister, plus the continuing debate over Brexit. The Right Honourable Lord Taylor of Warwick in a moment. Now, as you may know, the House of Lords in the UK is packed with British nobility, peers that are lords, dukes, viscounts, earls and barons. And amid the sea of white faces, you'll find Lord John Taylor wearing his ermine gown and his three-cornered hat. When he entered the House of Lords, he made history. He was the youngest lord and the only black one at that time. Before that, he was the first black government special advisor in Britain, advising the Home Secretary and Ministers of State. He is currently writing a book about Brexit and has spoken internationally about UK-US relations. During his 10-year tenure at the British Board of Film Classification, no movie got a film rating in Britain without going through Lord Taylor of Warwick. All this from the son of Jamaican immigrants who came to Birmingham seeking a better life. Never in their wildest dreams could they have imagined that their son would be made a life peer as Baron Taylor of Warwick on the 2nd of October 1996 on the recommendation of the then British Prime Minister John Major. Well, let's go straight away now to our London studios to speak with the Right Honourable Lord Taylor of Warwick. And uh, Lord Taylor, absolutely delighted to have you on the programme. Uh, first of all, just give us a sense of what it's like to be a baron and a black one at that. Well, greetings to you, Charles, from London. I am a baron, but I'm also a human being. So I brush my teeth, I go to bed, I do all the normal things. However, it is a privilege to be a member of the House of Lords, and I regard it as that. I mean, God has blessed me mightily. Just give us a sense of how that came about. I mean, you, you, you talk about yourself as an ordinary human being, but I mean, it's not, you know, it's not everybody who's sort of walking down the streets and brushing their teeth or wherever they brush their teeth that gets to be a baron. The reason I said it in that way is because it's very important not to get big headed, but to remain humble and to realize it's by grace. I became a baron through a very complicated sort of procedure in the sense that I was a barrister for over 20 years. I was a judge for a number of years. As you said, I was on the board of the British Film Board. I was uh, Britain's first black university chancellor. I um, headed up a number of charities. And I suppose I became a public figure throughout that time. And John Major was watching my career. I also did a bit of work for the BBC. And uh, he recommended me to the Queen. Um, to receive um, a peerage. Uh, and I mean, when you were offered the peerage, I mean, did you feel that it was because you were black or because they felt it was a way of giving you a, a reward or did they feel that you, you could make a sizable contribution to British society? That's a very good question, Charles. Now, John Major, when he... Um, asked me, do I, would I like to be a peer? He made it clear to me it wasn't because I'm black. It's because of the qualities, and the skills that I would bring to the House of Lords, and in particular, being a lawyer for a number of years. You know, my mother used to say to me, John, being black is not a profession. 
And I've always remembered that. Well, that, that, I mean, just let, let's talk a little bit about your family, then we'll come back and sort of talk about your time in, in the House of Lords. Your ancestral country is Jamaica, which is in the Caribbean. I mean, how did your family come to be in the UK? Well, my father came to uh, Britain after the Second World War. He couldn't get a job except as a cleaner, basically. And then they discovered that he could hit the ball with a bat. So he signed uh, professional cricket uh, terms with Warwickshire. So he was a cricketer. Uh, suffered a lot of racism. In those days, the signs in the windows were no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. So it was very difficult for him. But he stuck it out. He was a determined man. And my mother was um, a nurse. And it was a very difficult time in the 1950s, a lot of racism. But my mother was a praying lady, and uh, there's nothing better than a praying mother. And she prayed that one day I would be somebody. And so she lived to see me going into the House of Lords as Lord Taylor of Warwick. And when I came into the House of Lords, as you've mentioned, I was the only black lord out of 1,700 and the youngest. So I wasn't exactly in the majority. Well, absolutely. I mean, but, but having got into the House, I mean, you obviously had to get on with the job of being a member of the House of Lords. I mean, what has that been like, given the background you've just given us about, you know, you're, you're a black you know, man? Of course, you were very accomplished in British society, but nevertheless, I mean, you were entering the great bastion of British tradition. What, 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 is this, what has that been like in terms of your experience there? It's been a number of challenges. I remember very soon after I came into the House of Lords, Ebony magazine, the American magazine, asked me about the House of Lords. And they said, uh, so, Lord Taylor, uh, are there a lot of black people in the House of Lords? And I said, oh, yeah, it's full of black people. But, Lord Taylor, we thought you were the only black lord. I said, oh, yes, I am, but all the cleaners are black. So it's me and the cleaners. And so those formative years were very much a challenge. People would write to me as the black lord, House of Lords and letters would get to me. Now we have a few more. I think there are five black male lords now and uh, about six or seven uh, black female lords. But remember, there are 800 lords. So we're still very much in the minority. And in many ways, you know, <laughs> when you're black, you're expected to be better than in many ways, not just to fit in, but to excel, be better than the other person. But in many ways, I don't worry about that. I just have to do what I think is right and what God's will is. And uh, he will make a way. Well, well, he certainly made a way um, as far as uh, you, your, your sort of concern. But, I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, the way, the, the demographics, as it were, in the House of Lords. I mean, I've been there a number of times. I was there a few weeks ago to have lunch with you. Um, and you were clearly, as you pointed out, in, in the minority there. We were in the minority because <laughs> I was there with you. But let's just keep talking about your time as a baron and a member of the the House of Lords. I mean, when you entered in, in 1996, when you entered the House, I mean, it was thought that if anyone could stir the world to action in support of better race relations in the UK, you would. I mean, uh, you inspired so many black and ethnic minorities, including myself. I was in the UK, of course, at the time, working at another broadcasting organization. Um, myself and many other black ethnic minorities, um, you, you know, by your mere presence as an Afro-Caribbean person in, in the House of Lords. I mean, what success have you had since then in changing the world in Britain? Well, you have to change the world in bite-sized chunks, really. Take one day at a time. And I found um, initially, and even today, that many debates will start off as if somehow black people don't exist. And uh, often in debates, you might get 50 or 60 lords speaking. And then I realize that nobody's talking about the black contribution. And so in that respect, I will add to that debate. But I don't make color the most important part of what I bring. It's my um, innermost skills that I try to bring. But there is, a, I think, an overall um, lack of knowledge of the black community in Britain, especially the black churches and the black charity networks and the black business community. There's a, almost a, it's almost like a, an underground and it needs to come overground, it needs to become part of the mainstream. And in that way, I can hopefully enlighten the government. 
I recall in, in one of the, um, the chats you had about your time in, in the House of Lords, so you, you, you commented um, the first day, about the first day that you, were, you entered the House of Lords uh, wearing your sort of ermine coat and your sort of three-cornered hat, and, um, and there you were, and somebody said, oh, they've got a black one. I mean, what was that like? Did, did that immediately make you feel, good God, this is going to be a yes, tough I one? Yes, I mean, I... <laughs> Yes, you're absolutely right. And I bowed to the Queen's golden throne, feeling very pleased. And one of the old uh, earls said, oh, it's a black one. But he said it not in a malicious way. And, I, you know, if you're going to let comments like that, uh, you know, depress you or defeat you, then you're not up to the job. I just thought, OK, there's a challenge here. Uh, in fact, it was during my first week in the House of Lords. I was in um, a reception in the Chumley Room and... Uh, one of the old Viscounts came up to me and said, oh, could you get me a gin and tonic, old boy? Because he thought I was the waiter. Um, I was the only black person in the room. I actually went, I was going over to the drinks uh, place anyway, so I got him a gin and tonic, gave it to him, said, thank you, my good man, thank you very much. And then another member of the House of Lords came over to me and said, Lord Taylor, are you settling in? And the Viscount, I thought, was going to have a heart attack. I thought, hang on, I've been in the House of Lords two days and I'm creating <laughs> a heart attack already. And I, I, I caught the man before he fell on the floor. And he said, I, I, I'm so sorry, I, I thought you were the, the waiter. Why did you get me the gin and tonic? I said, because you asked me. It's not a problem, I was going that way anyway. And so from that day, whenever I spoke in the House of Lords, that old Viscount who thought I was the waiter would say, hear, 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 whatever I said. So you see, my reaction to him was friendly. Um, I could have been angry, but that would have got me nowhere. And we became good friends. And, you know, it was his ignorance. He didn't understand. But once he got to know me, he realized the color of my skin did not reflect the content of my character. And it's the inner character that was more important. And he, he understood that. Absolutely. But that's a fascinating story you're, you're telling us here. And, and thank you once again for joining us here on, on Arise News. I mean, there seems to be this impression, Lord Taylor, in the UK and beyond, that members of the House of Lords, I mean, life peers like yourself, hereditary peers, are people who have never earned a penny in their lives, but are spectacularly rich and fawned over. And, and many people disapprove of that kind of what they've called idleness, um, you know, of people who use their positions to, as it were, freeload on the public purse. I mean, how close to the truth is that impression? It's not true at all, Charles. You recall when you came to have lunch uh, with me in the House of Lords a couple of months ago, um, you were with me for about um, an hour and a half. During that time, you'll recall, I voted seven times. Every time I took a mouthful to eat, I had to get up and vote because the bell rang to vote. So you will um, attest to the fact that we're not sort of sitting around doing nothing. As to wealth, um, uh, again, it was the Ebony magazine, uh, the American magazine, asked me, so what Okay, we've had a bit of a freeze there. Um, on, on that uh, sort of interview, but we'll, we will be going back to it in a moment. We're going to take a short break. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead, including more of our chat with Lord John Taylor of Warwick. We'll get his take on President Trump's state visit to the UK, an opportunity to strengthen the so-called special relationship or a divisive figure that represents the worst of the propagation of extreme right-wing nationalism, bigotry and hatred, according to his critics. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world. I'm Charles Anya Golu. Now, I understand it's a somewhat 
On certain summer's day in London, a lot of cloud around and some sunshine peeping through, perhaps a fitting weather metaphor for a mixed kind of state visit for US President Donald Trump. Earlier in the day, thousands of people lined the road directly outside Buckingham Palace around the Queen Victoria Memorial. Inside the palace, President Trump arrived by helicopter, greeted by Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall, uh, followed by a private lunch inside the palace, hosted by Queen Elizabeth II. The big set piece events today will be a state banquet at the palace tonight. The Queen has, of course, met many U.S. presidents, but this is only the third state visit by an American president. The others were George W. Bush and Barack Obama. They are a big deal, and this one is unlike any other visit by an American president in the history of relations between the two countries, the presence of a divisive figure in a country divided by its own politics. President Trump has already broken what some regard as a sacred convention of diplomacy, that a head of state doesn't interfere in the internal affairs of a country he or she is visiting. The president's comments on Brexit and contenders for the Conservative Party leadership are unconventional, to say the least. Well, the Queen, of course, represents the best of British tradition, and with her, the House of Lords, members of which will be part of the event surrounding President Trump's visit. The Right Honourable Lord John Taylor is one such member. He attends all the big events, including garden parties for visiting leaders at Buckingham Palace, and Lord Taylor is still with me from our London studios. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us, Lord Taylor. Sorry about the abrupt to break uh, the sort of a few minutes ago we had a you know interruption of the signal coming from London but what is the value of the state visit bearing in mind the number of people who don't want Donald Trump in the UK well I should make it clear I'm I love America I'm married to an American I think you showed a photograph of my wife, uh, Laura, who is uh, born and raised in Texas. I'm keen on Americans, but we have a special relationship with America. They're our biggest trading partner outside of uh, Europe. Uh, we have a, a special link with them historically from a cultural point of view in terms of the military and the defense of our nations. We share information. We worked with America in defeating Nazi Germany in the Second World War. These are powerful points. And we can't forget our mutual links. Now, as to Donald Trump, I understand that he's a, a divisive figure. But even if you don't respect the man, respect the office, he was democratically elected by the people of America. And we should respect that. It is the post, not the person we should be looking at. Well, I, I, I think a lot of people would agree with you that uh, the relationship is with America and not necessarily with the person who's occupying the office of the presidency. But I mean, there are, you know, you're a, I mean, you're a member of the House of Lords, uh, you're next door to the House of Commons, uh, lots of British politicians who don't want to greet Mr. Trump, uh, not least the leader of the Labour Party, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, the Speaker of the House of Commons, and the Mayor of London, who in the latest Twitter row with Mr. Uh, Trump, uh, Donald Trump called a stone-cold loser. I mean, what's your take on that? Well, th this spat, as I call it, between the Mayor of London and Donald Trump is a little childish, really. I think uh, the Mayor of London needs to recognise that we need to get on well with America, because once we achieve Brexit, hopefully by the 31st of October, we will need to do trade deals around the world. And we have a great uh, trading tradition with America, as I said, our biggest trading partner outside of Europe. And Donald Trump has made it clear he wants to do trade more trade deals with this country. And we won't achieve that by insulting the man. Whatever you think of him, if, if he loses the next election, he'll be gone in two years. If he's re-elected, which I suspect he will be, he'll be gone in six years. But our relationship with America will still continue. So to insult him is foolish, in my opinion. We should welcome him. After all, we've invited the, the uh, Premier of China and also the uh, Saudi royalty. Now, China 
and Saudi Arabia, they're hardly democracies. We welcome them. So why not welcome Donald Trump, who is, you know, he was elected by the American people. Uh, and is that a point that you make uh, in, in Parliament? I mean, is that a point that you communicate to I, I do. The, your, your colleagues who are politicians in Britain? We, we have many debates about uh, America and so forth in um, the House of Lords. And I make a point of stressing the relationship between uh, Great Britain and America. And I support Donald Trump, not on everything, but he is trying to put America first. But in so doing, he has a heart for Britain. You can tell, you can see the pictures, how delighted he is to be in Britain. And we should nurture that relationship because that will be to our good. You know, the first um, duty of any government is to protect its nation. And we share defense uh, in, uh, intelligence and so forth and army intelligence with America. And we can't put that in jeopardy because of some stupid uh, childish argument um, uh, that the mayor of London has put forth. Well, obviously, it's not just the mayor of London, but but I mean, just going beyond, you know, that little spat, as you as you put it, uh, between himself and Sadiq Khan. I mean, there are supposed to be political discussions with Theresa May. But I mean, she's going in just a few days time. What's the point of the political discussions that are going to be had during the state visit? Well, you're right about Theresa May. She is uh, going. She's uh, and now she's going to retire. In fact, at the end of this week, or resign rather, at the end of this week. So she's in office, but not in power. But de facto, she's still our prime minister, and she'll be speaking uh, with him tomorrow morning. There's a business breakfast. Then there'll be uh, meeting, and I'm sure she'll raise a number of uh, issues like the Middle East, Iran. Um, Israel, uh, climate change, and she has a right to as prime minister, and he will show her the courtesy of speaking to her. But he knows that ongoing, it'll be uh, those who uh, follow her that he'll be really doing business with. But no, it, we can't waste this opportunity. She is the prime minister at the moment, and she should be meeting with him and having dialogue with him. And, and there's also controversy, controversy swirling around um, the Duchess of Sussex. I mean, does it matter that she's not going to be there? I mean, she says she's been, she's looking after her baby, which makes a lot of sense, but she's known to have views about President Trump and he's reciprocated. Is that a potential flashpoint? No, I don't think so, Charles, because look, uh, Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sussex, had a baby less than a month ago. She's still on maternity leave, so I don't think it's unreasonable that she'd want to look after her baby, Archie, rather than go through the rigours of, uh, you know, this, uh, this visit. Uh, there are others in the royal family who can, uh, you know, stand in for her. I think that would be fine. And he won't regard it as an insult. And yes, she said one or two things in the past. You know, it's, it's life. Um, she's not a politician. I, I think he won't bear a grudge. He, I know he, he was delighted to be at Buckingham Palace uh, th this afternoon. If he bore a grudge, he's hiding it very, very well. You could see how pleased he was to meet the Queen. That's what he's really concerned about. That, that, this is the nature of a man, to meet the Queen, to have those TV uh, pictures being back to America. It'll be shown on all the American channels. He's up for re-election in two years' time. And it's that, those royal pictures that will help to get him re-elected. And talking about uh, Mr. Trump's encounter with the Queen, I mean, you're well familiar with those things, being in the great bastion of tradition um, in Britain, the House of Lords, as I mentioned earlier. I mean, how, how much thought goes into planning those sort of e encounters? I mean, will every step of the president's interaction with the royal family and, and with the Queen be choreographed ahead of time, bearing in mind, of course, that the last time he came, he, he, he stepped in front of the Queen, which you're really not supposed to do. Yes, there's a lot of planning involved. I mean, it involves Buckingham Palace, 
the White House, the Foreign Commonwealth Office, the American Embassy based in uh, London, and also, of course, number 10 Downing Street, where the Prime Minister is. So all of those uh, groups really have to coordinate before the uh, state visit takes place. You're watching the Arise interview, plenty more still ahead, including more of our chat with the Right Honourable Lord Taylor of Warwick. We'll get his thoughts on the race to become the next leader of the governing Conservative Party in Britain. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world. I'm Charles Anya Gordon. Now, the UK is of course going through a period of profound political turmoil, no Brexit deal, a deadline of the 31st of October for Britain to leave the EU looming, and amidst all of that, the Conservative Party leadership contest. The race to become the governing party's next leader, and therefore the British Prime Minister, is in full swing. The current Prime Minister, Theresa May, is incidentally only Prime Minister for another four days, after which she will be there in a caretaker role while the governing Conservative Party finds a new leader. So how bruising a contest will it be? Well with me from our studios in London is the Right Honourable Lord John Taylor of Warwick. When Queen Elizabeth II made him a Lord in 1996, he became the only black baron in the world and the first black Conservative leader of uh, Conservative Lord in the UK since the 14th century when Parliament began. And he is, as I said, with me in our studios in London. Thank you very much indeed, Lord Taylor, uh, for your patience. Um, in spite of the fact that we've had a, a couple of technical hitches, I, I think it's broadly speaking, um, it's going very well, and I think most people are enjoying having you and hearing you and experiencing uh, the first black baron in, 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 in the United Kingdom. Now, let's talk about the leadership challenge, uh, the leadership contest that's taking place uh, in Britain. It'll get into full swing in the next few days. Um, what is your take on how it's going so far? Do you expect it to be a brutal affair? Well, Charles, there are 13 candidates so far, and uh, it could well be up to 20. I think it's far too many. Everybody except the Downing Street cat seems to have put their name down. And I just think it's not good, because we need to be looking really at the nation, not just at the Conservative Party. And I suspect that most of the people who have put their name forward, all but perhaps four or five, realise they're not going to be chosen as the, as the next leader. But they put the name forward to raise their profile and to hopefully get a government cabinet position in the future. And I think that is the wrong motivation. And is there any particular candidate that you favour? Well, Charles, the um, race does not start officially until June the 10th and it won't end until towards the end of July. And so I don't know who else is gonna put their name in the ring. So it would be wrong of me to uh, stick my name to any particular person at the moment. I, I'm going to leave it for a little while. Well, tell that to Donald Trump. I mean, even before he arrived in the UK, he was already causing a stir by appearing to back Boris Johnson to be the next prime minister. Yes, I mean, that's his style and uh, that's the way he behaves. I don't know why everybody feels it's so um, 
unusual because remember when Barack Obama came to England in 2016, he intervened in British politics. He said that if uh, Britain uh, left the European Union in terms of trade with America, it would be at the back of the queue. Now, the fact that he used the word queue clearly showed that that phrase was given to him by David Cameron's office because Americans don't, go, don't talk about queues. They talk about go to the back of the line. But the point I'm making is that Barack Obama, as president, intervened in British politics. So it's not so dreadful that uh, Trump has done that. Nevertheless, I mean, we're talking about a leadership contest here um, where, where there needs to be a, a sort of balanced field, I suppose. I mean, and I, I, I'm just wondering if an endorsement of any one candidate, how strong a message that is. I mean, Mr. Trump saying that he supports Boris Johnson. I mean, you're a member of the Conservative Party. You're a Conservative peer in the House of Lords. How much impact is that sort of message actually going to have on the leadership contest in the UK? I don't think it'll have that much because I think it will help uh, Boris Johnson to a certain extent, but also cause him some damage to a certain extent. It will probably just even out. The way the, um, the procedure works is that the other uh, Conservative members of Parliament have to decide amongst the 20 or so names who goes forward to the final two. Then the final two names goes through to the membership and they eventually decide who is to be the next leader of the Conservative Party. I would urge though, all those who put forward their names needs to speak to the nation, not just speak to the Conservative Party membership. Because when the next leader of the Conservative Party is chosen, de facto, they will become prime minister until the next general election. So they need to have a wider perspective, not just Brexit. I mean, after all, there are other issues, you know. Um, there's unemployment, um, there's housing. Uh, these are issues which are not being talked about because of Brexit. Well, we're going to talk a bit more about Brexit um, a little bit later. But, I mean, just looking at the Conservative Party from the outside in, the tensions, I mean, between not just the contenders, but the opposing sides um, in, in the Conservative Party is quite simply enormous. And, uh, I mean, a deep enmity appears to have developed within the party. And we saw um, the, the reaction of the British people when they voted for Nigel Farage's party. I mean, and, and gave the Conservative Party a very tiny nod in, in the European e elections. I mean, what sort of division has that has all this created within the Conservative Party and what does that say about the quality of governance that the British people are getting at the moment? But Charles you have to look at the history of the thing. The referendum was in June 2016. The result was this. 52% uh, voted for Brexit and 48% voted against Brexit. In other words to remain. So from the very beginning the country was divided. In many ways, it's not surprising. It was very much a binary choice. You're either in or out. You either stay in the European Union or you leave. That was the choice. So that was the vote. Do we stay in? Do we leave? Not how do we leave? And that is where the problem now is, because people can't agree on how we leave. And you talk about division in Parliament, but in many ways, that division is reflecting the division in the nation, indeed within families. It, go, it cuts across parties because the Conservative Party is divided, the Labour Party is divided on, on this issue. In many ways, it isn't a party political issue. So perhaps the question should be, what, is this, what damage has this done to British politics? I would like to look at it in a more of a positive way because one thing that's come out of this is that uh, people aren't apathetic about the issue. This is about the, the future of our nation. Indeed, it won't just affect um, Britain, you know. Uh, Britain is a member of the Commonwealth. There are 28 nations in um, the European Union, but there are 53 nations in the Commonwealth, including Nigeria. So Brexit will have a knock-on effect 
uh, for Nigerians. If we trade with Nigerians, we have uh, thousands of Nigerians uh, living and doing well in Britain. So this is something that will affect not just this nation. I think that people are showing a passion and we need to uh, draw on that passion and bring healing. And I think that the biggest challenge for the next leader of the Conservative Party is to bring together those warring factions. I mean, the good book says, blessed are the peacemakers. And after all this, sometimes you need to, you know, crack eggs to make an omelette. And at the moment, we're in the, the cracking eggs phase. But out of that, I, th I think something good will come out of it. I really do. In the, in the longer term, Brexit will be good for Britain because we need to do more trade with the Commonwealth, more trade with, with Nigeria. The reason why we can't do more trade with Nigeria and the rest of the Commonwealth is because of the European rules. We need to get away from the European shackles to do more trade with Nigeria and the rest of the Commonwealth. Well, we'll get to talk about Brexit, as I said, in, in more detail in, in a moment, and also the fact that you're actually writing a book about Brexit. Um, it'll be interesting to get your, your sort of more in-depth take on that. But just going back to the uh, leadership contest in the Conservative Party, uh, we've talked about Boris Johnson. You mentioned a few others. Um, how strong are the chances of the others who are not Boris Johnson? In other words, if Boris Johnson is to lose, who might be the runners and riders that are likely to stop him? Well, you use the expression runners and riders. It is a bit like the, the, you know, the grand national horse race at the moment. Yes, I mean, there are others like uh, Jeremy Hunt. Um, there's Dominic Raab. There are two or three others. Um, there are others also who are legends in their own kitchen you know no one's ever heard of them and I'm sure they're using this just to get publicity to rise to raise their own profile um, Jeremy Hunt I think he's not necessarily a very um, you know sort of charismatic person but he's a safe pair of hands um, and the, 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 it's often the person who is not the favorite that comes through to take the crown after all Margaret Thatcher was not the favorite to become leader of the Conservative Party John Major no one had heard of him, basically, and he came through. And when you have a number of candidates, what tends to happen, it splits the vote. There's no doubt if Boris Johnson gets through to the final two, I have no doubt he'll become the next leader of the Conservative Party because he's very popular with the general membership, but he's not so popular within the parliamentary group and it's other members of parliament he needs to persuade first, then he gets through that stage, then if his name is in the final two, then I think he'll become leader. But he's not guaranteed to get through to the final stage. Yes, he's a charismatic person, but was he a good... Um, you know, uh, minister when he was looking after, you know, international uh, matters. I, you know, the, the jury's out on that one. Just uh, given that, of course, the, um, you know, m most times the, the Conservative Party leaders are pushed out of office rather than jumping themselves, what will Theresa May be remembered for? What will her political epitaph be, briefly? I think in the short term, um, Theresa May's epitaph will not be a positive one because she staked her reputation on achieving Brexit and she has failed to do that. In the longer term, her reputation may be resurrected by what happens to the person that takes over from her because if that person doesn't do as well uh, and, and also fails, then people will look at... Um, Theresa May with a bit more sympathy but at the moment I'm afraid she's seen as a bit of a failure. She's a very shy person, it's a very tough job being a Prime Minister, not easy at all and you could see her ageing dramatically during what was a very gruelling process. Okay, stay with us Lord Taylor, you're watching the Arise interview, plenty more still ahead including more of our chat with the Right Honourable Lord Taylor of Warwick, he's writing a book on Brexit, we'll get his assessment of the best way forward as Britain battles to find a solution to the Brexit quagmire, stay with us.
Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world. I'm Charles Anya Gordon. Now, as the race to become the next leader of the Conservative Party in the UK heats up, most analysts will tell you that it is Brexit that will probably decide the outcome. The British uh, Home Secretary, Sajid Javed, who's standing, said at the weekend he would try to renegotiate the withdrawal deal and wouldn't seek an extension to the current Brexit deadline of October the 31st. The former leader of the House of Commons, Andrea Leadsom, is also running for the leadership. She says she doesn't support leaving the EU without an agreement, a no-deal Brexit. She proposes what she calls a three-step managed plan to achieve Brexit by the deadline. So plenty of debate still in the UK over Brexit, an issue that remains as divisive as ever. Well, Lord John Taylor of Warwick is a Conservative peer in the British House of Lords. He's been writing a book on Brexit and all the developments around it that have brought British politics into the crisis it is currently mired in. He rejoins me now from our London studios. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. Um, and of course, whoever wins um, this Conservative leadership context is going to inherit a poison chalice uh, called Brexit. It's going to be very difficult because there'll be a new leader, but the maths are still the same in the sense that Parliament's still in uh, gridlock. And so that new leader will have to find a way through that uh, gridlock. So I suppose that the question, uh, Lord Taylor, must be, I mean, the big question, where does Brexit stand right now? I mean, to, to make the big understatement of the century, Brexit is a bit of a mess right now and the road ahead looks very bumpy indeed. Well, that's one way of looking at it. People need to understand that Brexit is not an event, it's a process. What we've been looking at so far is the withdrawal agreement. We haven't even got on to the trade agreement. That's what Brexit is really about, uh, making trade deals with other um, nations in the world. So I'm not, you know, let's understand the position. Brexit is important. I'm not saying it's not. But Brexit will not change certain things. First of all, Britain is called Great Britain for a reason, because of its history, which you could say is a checkered history, but it has had a huge impact on the rest of the world. Um, its culture, its language, the fact that it has a sovereign queen who's respected around the world, its head of the Commonwealth. Those things will not change with Brexit. You know, we're the fifth richest nation in the world. We'll still trade with Africa, trade with the, the Commonwealth. We'll just do more of it. But whether we withdraw with a deal or not a deal won't change those basic points that I've just mentioned. I actually feel and more and more people are beginning to say this, that withdrawing with no deal wouldn't be a disaster. We wouldn't suddenly become bankrupt. We have a very strong economy. Um, un unemployment is very low. So if we just left without a deal, we wouldn't have to pay the European Union 39 billion pounds. That's what they want from us. And so we wouldn't have to pay that. And we could trade under WTO terms, you know, without a problem. I don't see that we have to agonize over this. What we need to do is get out because the British people have voted for Brexit and they are sick and tired of it. This referendum was three years ago and we're still arguing about this thing. And um, having a second referendum is pointless because the British people have already decided they want to leave. Nevertheless, of course, every uh, conservative uh, leadership contender has said that they want to leave with a Brexit deal. I mean, Theresa May uh, was very clear, and I mean, the, all the, um, the, the analysts and all the, the, the business uh, bureaus and so on have made it clear that Britain is going to suffer tremendously if it leaves the European Union without a deal. I mean, do you think that Brussels is likely to pursue a different strategy with whoever takes over from Theresa May? Or is it difficult to see the EU changing its mind on anything, given that their red lines, their strategy for Brexit was written years ago, and they are more likely to stick with that um, 
you know, that's already been chiselled out, as it were. Well, I should correct you because from what uh, Boris Johnson has said, he'd be quite happy to leave uh, without a deal. So would Dominic Raab. Of course, we would all prefer a deal. We need to get on well with our European leaders. But if they won't agree things with us, then we just can't keep arguing and arguing. We would, can just leave. The point that we need to keep no deal on the table so that the European Union knows that we could walk away if they don't give us what we want, which has to be a compromise. Life is always about a compromise. But please, Charles, remember one thing. The European Union needs us. like France and Germany. That is why the European Union are making it so difficult for Britain to leave, because they, don't, they know that if they made it easy for Britain to leave, others would leave very quickly, because in France there's a lot of anti-EU feeling, also in Germany. So they're going to make it difficult, but they need us. They need some sort of deal. Of course they're going to say no more compromise, no more agreement. That is part of the negotiation. Right. So, I mean, just getting back to that point about Brussels, I mean, given all that you've said, uh, it, it is fair then to say that the EU is unlikely to shift their position and especially not for somebody like Boris Johnson, for instance, who might come and not respect the process as much as Theresa May did. But you see, I disagree with that. Of course they're going to say they're not going to shift their position. They'd hardly say, yes, please, whatever you want, take it. No, they're going to play hardball. And the reason for that is because they're frightened of other nations leaving. I'm talking about the stronger nations, because one of the problems of the EU is that you've got um, countries with a strong economy, like, or relatively strong economy, like Germany and France, with other nations like Greece, that clearly is, well, it's more or less a bankrupt nation. And that's part of the problem. They cannot afford, because they need to balance their budgets, the European Union. So they don't, want, um, uh, they don't want France and Germany to follow suit, to immediately leave as soon after Britain leaves. That's why it's making it difficult. But they know eventually, eventually, there'll have to be some sort of compromise. And, and I should point out one thing. The people that we've been um, uh, negotiating with, the officials, they've, they're, they're going now. They're being replaced by other officials of the EU who may well take a different stance. So we're going to have a, a new people at the table, a new leader for the Conservative Party, a new leader, a new uh, leader for Britain, Prime Minister, and new EU officials. So in many ways, there is uh, hope for something to shift in terms of reaching some sort of deal. But if we can't reach a deal, we can leave. There's nothing to stop us. It's not, not illegal to leave the re European Union. And we won't have to pay that 39 billion, that $50 billion. Well, let's just be clear on, on your, ineluctably clear on your position, Lord Taylor, because, I mean, in 2016, during a pre-Brexit discussion on Fox News, you said, quote, if Britain leaves the EU, it would be bad for Britain and bad for the rest of the world. I mean, is that still your position today? It doesn't sound like it. I mean, I suppose my question is, are you a Remainer or have you become a Brexiteer? No, I've always been a, a Brexiteer. I think what you're referring to is a very short edited clip from a much longer interview that I gave in America to Fox News. Um, if you look at my speeches in the House of Lords, right from the very beginning when this debate started in 2016, I've always talked about Britain being stronger leaving the European Union. What, the point I was trying to make in the Fox News interview is that I'm very, very much uh, in favour of Europe. After all, geographically, Britain is part of Europe, and that's not going to change if you look at the map. But what I'm not in favour is the European Union. They're two different things. You could be in favour of Europe, but not in favour of the organisation called the European Union. After all, the European Union is actually an empire. If you look at the history of the world, we had the Egyptian Empire. Um, we, we had the Roman Empire. Now we have the European Empire. Every empire eventually fails because it overtaxes its 
member nations. It becomes autocratic. It tries to impose laws upon member nations and eventually they crumble. And the European Union will also eventually, eventually crumble, just like all the other empires have done. Lord John Taylor, I want to thank you exceedingly for being our guest on the Arise interview. Lord John Taylor is a member of the House of Lords in Britain. Well, that's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again for a fresh edition tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.